Hello and welcome to Wire Primetime. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan and today we will be discussing the topic of China. What's the health of the Chinese economy? Is the Chinese slowdown real or imaginary? Is the Chinese economy headed for a collapse or is this all wishful thinking on the part of people in the West and also to some extent in India? Joining me to discuss these and other topics related to the Chinese economy is Professor Barry Norton. You teach economics uh, and Chinese studies at the uh, University of California, San Diego, and you are also the author of landmark books on the Chinese economy, Chinese industrial policy, which are used as teaching aids, textbooks around the world. So thank you very much for um, taking the time to come to our studio. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Now, now you uh, are visiting India uh, and Delhi as part of uh, the program of the Institute for Chinese Studies, which is India's preeminent <coughs> China Studies think tank. You delivered uh, their very important annual lecture uh, on broad themes of the Chinese economy. And I want to start by, by putting a question that's on the top of many of our viewers' minds. We, we read about the Chinese economy and the current flavor of certainly Western coverage is that uh, the, uh, the China story is petering out. Uh, that the the uh, remarkable growth that we saw um, over three decades has not just slowed down, but is uh, perhaps uh, leading to a situation of of instability, turmoil. Uh, so you have a lot of this kind of negative coverage that the Chinese are headed for some kind of a some kind of a collapse. Uh, and on the other hand, the data, whether it's trade, whether it's growth, whether it's investment, uh, the data data doesn't look all that bad. Uh, so there is a there is a marked slowdown, but it's still head and shoulders above many uh, many other countries in the world. So, as somebody who's keenly watched the Chinese economy uh, for the better part of your academic career, where do you think? Uh, how would you characterize the state of the Chinese economy today? What are the fundamental problems that the Chinese leadership uh, feel they need to tackle? I think the so there are definitely elements of overreaction in the in these headlines that say, oh, China has peaked, we've reached the end of the China miracle. There might be a, an element of wishful thinking as well, uh, certainly in Washington. Um, but I think what people are reacting to is perhaps even a sense of shock that the China that people thought they had come to know seemed to have disappeared. And that China was a China that prioritized economic growth and it was extraordinarily resilient in the way that it responded to shocks and the way that policymakers adapted to new situations and of course was had the payback of the most rapid sustained growth of any economy in history and all of a sudden that economy is gone and we see this other economy which as you say is not is not a bad economy by sort of aggregate numbers but it's definitely not the very high speed growth economy. And more important, I think, policymakers don't seem to be acting in the interest of the economy. They're not taking effective steps to resolve economic problems. And so that raises the question of, well, what are they trying to do? And I think the short answer is they are trying to build China into a technology superpower that's capable of withstanding U.S. sanctions and other kinds of frictions, similar to what the West instituted against Russia. Uh, and they're sort of putting everything into that basket instead of growing the healthiest possible. So are, are you saying a sort of high-tech autarky in some sense, self-dependence, uh, reducing um, any dependence on the West is the principal priority right now, even if it comes at the cost of, say, sensible macroeconomic policies and other kinds of industrial policy? That is exactly what I'm saying. And and one of the striking things about the most recent National People's Congress, is, uh, which took place just uh, not quite a month ago, is they publish a list of priorities for the coming year, for 2024. And they actually demoted increased aggregate demand, which is what most economists think the econo the economy most needs, they demoted it from first place in 2023 to third place. And the first place objective is 
build what they call, and this is so abstract, it's almost meaningless, but build a modernized production system, which when you dive into their literature means this. High tech, high -tech uh, a whole complex ecology of high-tech services and specialized producers, as well as big firms. In the aftermath of the 2006-7-8 financial crisis, there was a marked shift, or so we thought, in the Chinese approach from sort of an investment-driven growth to more realizing the need for, to have uh, consumption. Uh, are you saying that that's no longer a priority, to promote, no longer to, a to promote consumption at the mass level? That's exactly right, and in fact, uh, you know, they, they have a series of five-year plans which have become, you know, they wax and wane in terms of how seriously they're taken. But right now they're again being taken very seriously. And, and the five-year plan actually says consumption will advance at the same stage as GDP. In other words, it will not be a driver. We will not use expanded consumption to lead, be a leading sector for the economy. And that's because they want to maintain the primacy of this manufacturing sector. Is China paying the price for strategic overreach? I mean, there was a time when the Chinese leadership spoke about the importance of sort of growing fast, but not seeing being seen as a threat to others. Oh, they definitely don't say that anymore. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so somewhere down the line, uh, perhaps uh, they are paying the price of their own success in terms of the size of their economy, but more importantly, paying the price for this shift that has been noticeable under Xi of a more assertive uh, you know, Chinese policy, particularly with regard to territorial disputes. We've seen vis-a-vis -vis India, for example, uh, a uh, increase in the stridency of the rhetoric and you actually have changes being attempted on the ground uh, with the Chinese nibbling away and trying to grab greater and greater amounts of Indian territory. And then you have South China Sea, you have other, other areas, this aggressiveness um, at the level of foreign policy is perhaps what is creating this turmoil in the first place then. Uh, definitely, and, le and let's come back to that in a second, but to, let's just wrap up this sort of the economic piece yes. because on the one hand they've got these very strong ambitions, uh, but they also have a very heavy debt load. And so they're aware that if they try to do too much, that uh, they're in danger of pushing up this debt load again and perhaps leading to a future crisis. So they've been rather tough on, on that side, but that means that the push for high-tech manufacturing crowds out, you know, uh, stimulus that would increase consumption, that would increase employment, that would be much more effective from an economic standpoint. So it's not a sort of direct, oh, they're paying the price of overreach, but it is an indirect version because their macro policy has been derailed by the priority they put on it. You said the Chinese government is not taking certain kinds of policy measures that they that common sense dictates they ought to. We'd heard a lot about the need for banking reform, the fact that uh, the sort of a, a malfunctioning or a badly functioning banking system had led to all kinds of debt, uh, debt problems. Uh, we know that Chinese local government is uh, heavily indebted. Uh, they borrowed and uh, are unable to pay back. Uh, Yet there was some talk, at least until three or four years ago, of financial restructuring and banking reform. Is that one of the things that they still are attempting to do, or has that also been a casualty of this push to high tech? They're still trying to do it, but their vision for it seems increasingly cloudy. So they did a pretty good job of reining in the non-bank financial institutions that, had, that were responsible for the accumulation of a lot of this debt. Um, basically just being tough on them and shrinking them without provoking a crisis. So that's pretty good. But on the other hand, the local governments, who as you say are themselves deeply indebted, very much impacted by the big real estate turndown, uh, there has been zero progress in terms of reforming the fiscal system, the tax system, and really giving them a more sound uh, base for their revenues and activities. And why is that? I mean, they seem to have lost some of the market-oriented reform vision that was so striking in previous decades, and they're just asking local governments to fill in and help the national priorities. What, one of the uh, consequences of, or one could even say the uh, product of 
uh, or one aspect of the China, current sort of approach of China to the world economy and to the region has been this idea of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which people in the West saw as an attempt by the Chinese side to, in a way, productively use some of its sort of investable surpluses and so on into creating assets and thereby winning over strategic uh, sort of benefits for China. Uh, do, you, do you see the BRI as a net positive uh, for the Chinese side or uh, is it beginning to uh, become a drag? And how do the Chinese leadership, uh, how, how does the Chinese leadership itself look at the BRI now? I think they remain committed to it. Uh, of course, it, it shrank considerably during the COVID era, uh, but we do see signs that they're, you know, rehabilitating it, starting projects a little bit less grandiose, but I think the underlying objectives are unchanging. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things about BRI, and of course, obviously for India, you, you naturally must be especially concerned about Pakistan and the Pakistan-China economic corridor. Um, but from the perspective of, BRI as a whole, probably its focus is more on Southeast Asia. And it's a, a long-term strategy to integrate Southeast Asia into a Chinese heartland through infrastructure construction. And I think the commitment to that has not wavered. For, for India, the concern vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, at least, has been that the Chinese so-called corridor runs through territory that belongs to India, which is in occupation of Pakistan, territory that was part of the sort of erstwhile princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. And I think that's that's a major factor at, the, at that bilateral level. But of course, uh, BRI is also seen as something which is uh, helping the Chinese make inroads in the rest of South Asia. So we've seen a situation where actually most of India's neighbors, uh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Nepal, Sri Lanka, the Maldives are all quite happy to be part of BRI. And s somewhere down the line, there's also is seen by India as an attempt to uh, encroach into Indian strategic space. Sure. Uh, in South Asia, but I think yeah, uh, the the South Southeast Asia focus seems to be pretty much uh, a priority. Although the Chinese also regard Africa and African investments as in the BRI as as very important. But uh, moving on from, uh, I mean, we know that the uh, the West and also India looks at the BRI not as some kind of a benign sort of aspect of globalization, which the Chinese try to present it as, but are very sort of aware of its sort of geopolitical consequences. And uh, the fact that this is uh, an attempt by the Chinese to, shall we say, make inroads all over the world as part of their sort of long-term strategic competition with the US and the West. Uh, and perhaps because of BRI, but also because of COVID, because of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and China's sort of support for Russia in that war, there's all this talk now of finding ways to reduce the dependence of the U.S. and the Western economies on China. Sometimes this is called decoupling, de-risking, uh, friend-shoring. Uh, broadly speaking, there is sort of an awareness that the West cannot afford to allow business as usual to continue vis-a-vis -vis dealings with the Chinese side. How uh, successful, first of all, how, uh, w what would you identify as the primary contours of this strategy of decoupling, yeah. uh, and then let's discuss how successful uh, that approach has been. That's a great question because as uh, implied by the question, there are so many different dimensions and the progress has been very uneven in different dimensions. And I would certainly distinguish between uh, the sort of first aspect that comes out directly out of our discussion of BRI just now, which is, you know, in addition to the purely economic BRI, there's clearly an effort to create uh, a corridor from coastal China through the Indian Ocean, through the Persian Gulf, into the Mediterranean uh, that inv includes ports that have facilities uh, run by the Chinese, including in Greece. Uh, and I think Western powers are very concerned about this for purely strategic military reasons. Right? Um, but um, the second most, and, and so that's definitely an issue, and uh, the second most important is the, the high-tech competition, where essentially um, the Biden administration's position is that the, our effort is to 
reduce is to slow down Chinese access to a limited number of techs that are have crucial military application. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we don't know what the crucial military application is, but I think there's a vision of a sort of future battlefield, you know, intelligent, where both sides have access to artificial intelligence, multiple, you know, connected weaponry, yeah. and everybody feels this is going to be completely different, but nobody knows exactly what it's going to be like. So American policy is to slow down China in that. Um, and then the third thing is, um, yeah, overall economic dependence. And there's been uh, some movement on all of these, but I think it's probably fair to say initial, very initial stages, and the results so far have been modest, but the powers are positioning themselves for a long-term game and it's very unclear exactly how it will how it will work and how it will change. But this is what the future. Uh, if we were to sort of separate out decoupling in, or, or look at four aspects of it, the first being, as you said, the high tech uh, side, and clearly there this is a priority. And um, certainly, data seems to indicate that the, the American side has achieved some some measure of success uh, in terms of slowing down. Although the, you know, the, the, there's been some. Uh, reporting of, of Chinese success in terms of microchips and other things, uh, which which is surprising. But there's, there's the high-tech aspect, which is number one. Number two is would you, uh, what one could say is the um, FDI sort of. So in other words, uh, are, are American firms still investing as much in China and is China as much of, of an attractive investment destination for them as it was before? Third, is the U.S. buying uh, from China in terms of imports, consumer products, as much as it used to. And fourth, this sort of uh, emerging question now of looking at Chinese uh, investments and Chinese products uh, in the U.S. from a strategic lens. So the sort of controversy of a TikTok or, uh, or, or, or Chinese 5G equipment and so on and so forth. So if one were to, I mean, we've, we've looked at the high tech to a certain extent. On FDI, do you see, uh, does the data bear out uh, a slowing down of American investment into oh, China? Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, but it's a little hard to tell the extent to which this is driven by the fact that they are pulled in two directions. They have to look over their shoulder at the American government as well as looking at the Chinese government. Um, but certainly Chinese policy is also a big driver here because essentially China has said, we welcome you, we want you to come and invest. Oh. But by the way, as soon as we learn to do what you're doing, we'll squeeze you out. Mm -hmm. And I think American firms feel very strongly that they are no longer seen as part of China's future. But that was the Chinese approach, I mean, for the last 30 years, right? I mean, China today is, has not, didn't become the world's biggest exporter of motor cars without, without adopting technology that foreign investors brought in, right? For sure, but, but I think there's a big distinction between you know, I mean, we look at Apple, right? And of course, Apple starts out simply assembling its phones in, in China and of course now in India. Um, but it's in Apple's cost uh, incentive structure, they want to qualify local suppliers. So they support yeah. the upgrading of the Chinese economy. It's actually been very successful. But the question is, does China welcome that as a long-term mm -hmm. presence or not? And I think Apple is starting to feel, well, we're not so sure anymore. So, so there's some evidence of uh, FDI uh, being affected. Yeah. Uh, uh, the third basket, uh, US, uh, US imports from China. I've seen some data. Uh, I'm looking at a recent IMF study, uh, I think putting the figure at around 7 to 8%. In other words, the percentage of US imports from China, uh, the, the shrinkage. Right. Uh, and and the IMF seems to suggest that the beneficiaries are Vietnam, Taiwan, India too, and India and also yeah. Mexico. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So um, and of course, interpreting those numbers is a little bit difficult because on the one hand they're genuine beneficiaries like India, and on the other hand they're sort of partial beneficiaries such as Vietnam and Mexico, where Vietnam exports lots of solar panels to the United States right now. Well, where do the solar panels come from? Yes. China, exactly, right? So uh, this, in a way, I think is actually maybe a little bit positive, mm -hmm. a, a, a little bit of hypocrisy in the system that greases the wheels. I mean, we need cheap solar panels. Yeah. 
Yeah. And now we get them for the so, so, so these are these are tariff driven changes, right? I mean, Chinese Chinese imports into the U.S. have declined because of higher tariffs. So in other words, they are not as cost competitive as they were earlier. But as you said, uh, the Vietnamese or others who are exporting to to the U.S. Uh, have in, have perhaps even deepened their uh, their own technological and investment dependence on China. So there is so there is a reduction in direct um, dependence of on China uh, from the U.S. side, but indirect dependence uh, continues. Do you think this is also a double-edged sword? Because in a sense, it's tying. I mean, even as it develops a market in the U.S. say for for Vietnamese solar panels. It's, in, it's, it's, it's also fulfilling a key goal of the Chinese BRI project, which is, which is to uh, uh, integrate China as part of a supply chain. Uh, of course, it's two-way. They want Vietnam also to be part of a supply chain for Chinese goods being sold. But the fact that these two economies are getting closer together is, is a... Xi would like that, President Xi, wouldn't he? Yeah, he does. And he had a recent meeting with the first party secretary of Vietnam, and you could tell that the two of them were very happy together. They were having a good time. So. <laughs> the fourth basket, uh, Professor Norton, on decoupling, uh, TikTok, uh, you know, various Chinese products, high tech. Uh, we've seen over the last couple of years, very sh you know, a real sharpening of, of, of rhetoric uh, from the administration, from US legislators. There's a lot of hostility and Chinese pushback. How do you see that playing out eventually? Do you think TikTok um, uh, might actually have to exit America fully? It's quite possible, yeah. Um, I mean, I, it, it's, it's very hard to say what's going to happen because I think there are, two, there are two very different forces at play. You know, one is that uh, this American shift on China has been pretty indiscriminate. You know, both parties... Uh, are very aware of the China challenge and the potential security threats, um, and so politically, you know, there's no, there's no serious voice in America that says, "Oh no, we should, we should slow this down," and and therefore there's not much discussion of what forms of protectionism, because that's what it is, are modest cost and things that we should accept for strategic reasons. And, and what forms are just shooting ourselves in the foot by, you know, uh, cutting ourselves off from a low-cost supplier. So, so that's, a, that's a little bit hard to say how that's going to go. And, of course, the other part is just in this new era we're in where in data collection and processing could potentially have security implications. Sure, sure. And so it's, it's not crazy. You know, the administration has said, oh, Chinese equipment at ports is a security risk. Is that true? Yeah. A lot of people doubt it, but it's not impossible. And so how deep will the sort of information decoupling go? And I think actually TikTok is part of that big, big issue. Right. Uh, if I understood you correctly, you seem to be suggesting that the way the debate has evolved uh, and exists in the US today, <clears throat> there is actually no constituency in the US which is coming out openly against uh, decoupling uh, uh, or, and against dif the different forms that this is taking. Is that what you, because I know in the past, it's not as if the US and China have not had their trade tensions and their geopolitical tensions, but there's always been uh, a strong business constituency in, in the US that has said, look, look let's just go easy. Uh, we have a lot of good stuff going with the Chinese. Let's not jeopardize that. Are you saying today that that constituency uh, has either shrunk considerably or has lost its political voice? It has definitely shrunk and it is almost completely silent mm -hmm. politically. Um, and so you have some, you know, sort of academic economists saying, you know, beware of the costs of protectionism, free trade is good, don't forget this, you know, be careful. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, a, you know, but they have no no right. political force, right? And so, no, there's no political force. Even farmers, who after all should support trade with China, because we still have a significant agricultural surplus with China, they're pretty, pretty silent. Uh, uh, Professor Norton, closing comments. Uh, the U.S. is going into uh, election season, and, um, you know, Donald Trump, uh, the specter rises again. Uh, much as 
you know, he is a divisive figure and people, you know, he excites strong opinions on either side. But I think uh, viewers would, here would like to know uh, what shape would U.S. policy towards China take if there were to be a Trump presidency again? Uh, I know that in India, uh, many people in the establishment, um, unlike in Europe, say, favor uh, a Trump sort of return, in part because Trump uh, appears to be more singularly focused on China and regards Russia as somewhat of a distraction for the U.S. Uh, if that, in fact, happens and that Trump um, says that, look, the U.S. main competitor rival threat is China, everything else is a diversion, uh, A, are we correct in that assessment? And B, if so, uh, how do you see um, U.S. policy towards China evolving in a Trump 2.0? Um, first of all, I think in Trump 2.0, China will be swamped by the things that happen inside the United States. Even though, you know, we care very much about foreign policy, uh, there's going to be so much chaos. So his domestic agenda and the responses... Because part of his domestic agenda is to essentially attack the federal government and yeah. shrink it. So the federal government is not going to have much capability. Combine that with the fact that Trump really doesn't support alliances. He doesn't really believe in alliances, so so he's thinking of, you know, a kind of fortress America and the world, uh, whereas Biden policy is let's coordinate with Europe, with Japan, with India, and have a stable coalition that balances China. So I think they're they're they share really a similar sense that China is the chief threat, but with a very different channel to get there. All right, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, Professor Norton, thank you so much for sharing your expertise on China with us. Uh, that's it for today. Hope to see you again in another edition of Wire Primetime.